Hello and good morning friends, welcome to the CC Edusat Live Lecture, dear friends. Uh, the series Indian Writing in English uh, is on verge uh, to be completed. But dear friends, uh, every time we have something new for you and your curiosity to know more and more, uh, help us to conduct more and more lectures for you. Dear friends, in uh, today's session, we would be talking on uh, the famous novelist uh, R.K. Narayan. And for this discussion, we have once again with us in our studios, Professor Anand Prakash. Professor Anand Prakash is a retired professor from Department of English Delhi University and uh, Dr. Prakash uh, through this series uh, has contributed a lot and uh, through him as well as uh, through uh, his uh, subordinates, his uh, uh, colleagues, his friends, uh, we uh, gained a lot and we believe that the new series which we would be starting very soon would be beneficial for us too. So without wasting any time, uh, I would like to welcome uh, our guest Professor Anand Prakash once again and we would like to have uh, uh, another vivacious uh, session on uh, the famous novelist R.K. Narayan. Hello sir, welcome to the Set Lecture. Thank you Geetika <coughs> for your very encouraging words and uh, welcome viewers, good morning to you. And uh, today's lecture, as has been announced by Kitika, uh, is uh, R.K. Narayan, novelist. Uh, <clears throat> well, a novelist is a combination of uh, so many different aspects of life, uh, intellectual, uh, creative, uh, thoughtful, realistic. All these are combined in uh, the novelist. And uh, yet, you know, the <clears throat> major, the dominant mode of expression uh, in the case of R.K. Narayan and his, uh, you know, uh, people uh, in the same domain. Therefore, they are called novelists. They are fiction writers. And uh, novel, novel is a long fiction uh, in the sense, you know, that uh, there is no length limit for the novel. It can be uh, from 200 pages, 150 pages onwards uh, up to 1,000, 2,000 pages. And uh, the number might increase. Uh, it's a form uh, we have discussed earlier uh, that came into being only recently uh, in history, uh, in the 18th century to be precise, so far as Europe is concerned. And in India, this novel form, this fiction form, long fiction form, this emerged in the 19th century, but the major novels, most of them, were written in the 20th century. So we have a century and a half to give to the uh, origin and evolution to this novel form and uh, uh, R.K. Narayan is a <coughs> novelist proper. One, you know, who gave all his life uh, majorly to writing novels. And uh, 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 his novels uh, cannot be easily counted. Uh, they may not be easily, you know, uh, recollected and uh, brought back to uh, critical attention uh, easily, uh, <coughs> which, is, which means a lot so far as uh, R.K. Narayan is concerned. He, in fact, uh, literally traversed the whole of the 20th century. Uh, he is born in 1906 and he dies in 2001, a good, you know, 95 years. And uh, he is not only a product of uh, the 20th century, which of course he is, but he is also a producer of the 20th century. Uh, through his novels, he uh, depicts the reality in the 20th century India. Uh, he. Um, uh, after depicting also, uh, you know, defines, characterizes uh, the kind of uh, society uh, that surrounds him. And uh, he uh, gives an impetus to the intellectual and creative urge uh, uh, that is there in the readers through his novel writing. So I say that he is a product of the 20th century and he is also a producer of the 20th century, particularly in aesthetic cultural terms. Uh, <coughs> his full name that will be interesting. It's a, it's a uh, four word name uh, Rasipuram, Krishna Swami, Ayar, Narayan Swami. And uh, then he shortened it for the benefit of most readers and critics like me, uh, you know, uh, who would be uh, finding it a bit, bit you know, difficult to uh, go uh, across the entire length of his name. So for us, he is RK Narayan and Narayan. And uh, well, when we are in our, you know, slightly uh, uh, informal mood, we simply call him RKN. It's that kind of a name because he relates so well with us. We relate so well with him. 
when we read his novels, we realize that he's talking about us. And uh, unlike many others in the 20th century, he relates at the level of emotions, at the level of thought, at the level of what can be called, you know, in the 20th century existentialist jargon, at the level of being. He recognizes the being of people in the 20th century and he tries to capture that to the best of his capacity and most successfully, I must say. So uh, <clears throat> his works are set in the fictional South Indian town of Malgudi. That is important. And at the moment, uh, you know, uh, we hear the word uh, Marguli, uh, Marguli mentioned uh, in a discussion, we go back to some of the popular representations of his short stories in the 1980s on the television. And he became almost a household name in the middle class uh, viewers of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, watchers of uh, television. Uh, in those days, you know, it was a middle class phenomenon. Today, uh, uh, the TV has also entered the, the lower middle class and the lower, uh, the, the lower classes, so-called. And uh, uh, there is a plethora of channels today, but in the 1980s, when, uh, you know, this uh, particular serial, uh, Marguri Days was introduced, then of course there used to be just one or two channels uh, for, the, for the whole population. So, um, and uh, but the fictional South Indian town of Malgudi, that is important. It's a fictional town. You can't identify easily. I met, you know, some friends from South India and uh, they know the, the environment, uh, you know, where uh, R.K. Narayan lived. And uh, there were scholars, some of them, and uh, I went to the books to find out where Malgudi is. But Malgudi is nowhere. Malgudi, that way, is a fictional town. He created it with the help of his imagination. And how he did it? How he peopled this place. How he you know, uh, placed different characters here. Why he placed those characters there? How they talked, what they talked, how they treated one another, how they composed you know, ideas uh, through, through their uh, actions and, and, and through their dialogues. All that is captured so well and in fact constructed, imagined and constructed by the writer. So it's a, it's a fictional town. And uh, uh, some people have, you know, those who are critically uh, more alert than people like me, uh, they have tried to identify, uh, you know, the, the town and its characteristics. And it is perceived that uh, the less, next novel that he will talk after, uh, you know, capturing life of uh, Malgudi in one novel, then he'll add certain things and take away certain other things. And this, this uh, place changes in his novels as, as, as he is depicting it. And uh, that is remarkable, you know, that somebody creates a town, a small town, and then, you know, he brings in lots of things as he keeps on writing about uh, this town. And every time the, the, the town has emerged as something different. What does it show? You ask this question from yourself. I ask this question from myself. What does it show that the same town with the same name is changing uh, in the next novel or the novel following it? Uh, well, so far as I'm concerned, I would say that since the uh, times, since the situations, since the conditions in India change, you know, from year to year and decade to decade, therefore, uh, in the meanwhile, as, as he would have lived, you know, uh, in those decades, he would have learnt a lot more about the, the society of his time, and that learning would uh, percolate uh, to his to his description uh, as, as he gives it in the uh, following novel. So that way, uh, it's a fictional South Indian town. South Indian is important. Names given to characters of South Indian, uh, long names like this. There is a kind of a caste system. There is a kind of caste hierarchy. There are some orthodoxies. Uh, within those orthodoxies, some characters shine, and and, and they amuse us. So all that you know uh, is is the, is the flavor of uh, the, the uh, you know South Indian life. Uh, very serious people, taking others very seriously, taking themselves also quite seriously. Sometimes talking pompously, sometimes you know pulling each other's leg, criticizing one another, and enjoying themselves. This is a different kind of a you know existence. Uh, very lively, very vivacious. That is there in South India, and uh, he gets, gets the crux of it in his novels, not merely through direct statements and descriptions, but also through dialogues. And uh, in the dialogues are sometimes short. Sometimes there, there, there's a twinkle in the eye of the, of the, of the speaker, as, as, as is shown in the dialogue, and there are silences. This means that uh, the, uh, the writer is, in fact, enjoying 
uh, taking you know pictures, uh, one and the next picture from life as he imagines it in Malgudi, puts it on page, and then you know he, with the help of the description on the page, regales the audience, entertains the audience, and that is what Arkanarayan is doing all the time. So, uh, <clears throat> from that uh, fictional town that he has created in his writing, uh, let's uh, think of. He brings out in clear terms the innocence of childhood. It's very difficult to write uh, about children. The children have that a different kind of imagination, and 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 they are very crea very creative. And in fact, choosing children to write about, he he chooses children to write about. He puts you know three or four children or more. Uh, on the page and then he makes them talk and the way they talk and the way they plan all that is remarkably presented in his novels and uh, he is uh, himself touched by the innocence he knows that they are wrong in, ma in many cases that they are bragging that they, they, are, they are teasing one another and, and, and they are helping one another and they are being sweet all this Arkindarayan is able to imagine capture and express through his writing on the page. So he brings out in clear terms the innocence of childhood, and it's a remarkable thing. Innocence of childhood, you know, uh, in, in uh, the Western, in Western Europe and in India. I'll, I'll also give one reference from India. Now, uh, the innocence of childhood is a major theme, because this childhood, when it is captured in that kind of a scenario, then it shows us the mirror. In fact, we learn a lot from uh, uh, reading the writing about children. Because then we know that we were once children, but then we became something different. And that difference is negative. Today we are mechanical, today we, are, we obey uh, you know, others, today we expect obedience from others. And this, this you know, puts a kind of a wall between one person and another. But you put two children together and uh, they, they, they enjoy uh, each other's company and they never bother about any walls. In fact, they can't even imagine that there can be walls between two people and then between two generations or what. So, uh, because children relate very well, therefore, uh, this person seems to be fascinated by uh, the, the, this particular penchant for, uh, among children and he then decides to write about them in detail. That is important. The second thing is that in, in child what he sees is wonder. A child always wonders. A child always has wide eyes. You tell something the child and the child does not understand what it is, therefore, the child will show the wonder on the face in, in, in his or her eyes and, and would like to respond in a manner that you would start thinking whether uh, the, the, the child knows or knows less or knows more than we, we, we think he or she does. So that way there is a sense of wonder in child children and that wonder is recognized by uh, our writer Arkindarayan. Creativity. So don't ever think you know that children don't know anything that they are fools. Nothing of the kind. In fact, when you scold children, we say all this, all, all, uh, all this to them. But no, in, in their thinking, in their mind, they are very creative people. They, 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 they uh, with the help of imagination, create something new uh, in, the, in the same dialogue. They ask questions which set us thinking. And uh, we start thinking about, we, we start wondering about our own behavior. Sometimes they, they, they show, show us the mirror so very harshly and cruelly that uh, we, we, are one, we are not just uh, wonderstruck but also rendered speechless. So that's the kind of thing you know, that children have and he knows that they are very creative and uh, they believe in the collectivity of effort. This is important. If you give me some work, I would at the most involve one or two more people. I would not discuss things you know, with anybody and everybody that, 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 that I know. I will keep the whole thing to myself and in fact I will be telling in that case myself you know, that I know better than all the people around me. Children don't do this. In fact, children will always share their apprehensions, their wonder, their, their, their creativity, their plans, what they fear, what they enjoy, all that they share with the rest of the people and then you know they get together to create something new out of it. That getting together is very important. I think we should learn this from children that you put 10, 15 people and they start planning you know an activity which will involve all of them. So this kind of a, a you know, collective effort the children have uh, the, the sense of that effort is missing in most of the behavior of the males. So, uh, in his uh, fiction, uh, when, when a child is presented, then this child is always relating to 
some other child or some other children and together they plan and together they execute those plans. And they experiment, they learn from their actions and then they say, okay, now uh, since I failed, uh, one child would say, let's try another trick and, and, and they bring in another trick. Now, uh, Arkadana is not the first one to do it. Great writers always have engaged themselves with this kind of a pursuit that is there in children. Uh, the famous Mark Twain in the 90th century comes to mind. There are many more. In fact, in West there is a lot of uh, rich literature so far as children's imagination uh, is concerned. Anyway, uh, <coughs> now this is what the children have, this is what the children enjoy and this is what fascinates R. K. Narayan in his fiction. Then you know, uh, when it comes to uh, the depiction of the place that he chose for, uh, you know, uh, presenting for our benefit and entertainment, uh, Malgudi. So what is Malgudi? And uh, uh, in, in the sense, you know, what does it stand for? It's not there in all the novels. It's there uh, in the initial novels majorly and then he comes back to it again and again and he writes stories about uh, the place, all those things. But then, uh, <coughs> whether he writes, he's writing about Malgudi or is he writing about another town, which is identifiable in some cases, or he is picking up a theme in presenting it. What he is basically doing is that he is depicting the larger community in the microscopic form. Microscope, very small. A very small thing is shown with the help of the microscope. And uh, you feel as if you know, the writer is uh, having the microscope in his hand and he is uh, putting it in front of him and through it he is seeing different people in their ordinary small actions. There, of course, he does. But then the opposite is said that microscopic depiction of larger community by this person. So larger community is the whole of India. It may be the whole world. But then he is he's, he's talking only about a small town. He is talking only about a child or two or ten children. But then when you read him, when you take help from him and, and then project you know, for your benefit, when I project it for my benefit, through his lens, something that I saw myself, then you know that lens shows that even though the uh, work is small, the, the incident is small, that incident in fact symbolizes the larger life of society. So even though the descriptions are small, even though it's a small town, a small place, even though it's, uh, he's talking about children or he's talking about a few people from there, what actually he does is that he makes almost everything symbolical. He presents it literally, you start enjoying it as if you know it's happening in front of you, but then as you realize after some time that you know he, 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 he has in fact brought in a lot of suggestions through those simple and small things. So the description is microscopic, but the imagination captured by the description is of largeness, is of completeness. So that kind of uh, you know creative abilities is what uh, Arkandaran uh, stands for. Let's uh, take a quote from him regarding writing. Uh, th th this quote is uh, his words. Past is gone, he says. Present is going. And tomorrow is, and see his way of <laughs> presenting things, and tomorrow is day after tomorrow's yesterday. It's a fantastic thing he's saying. That you know, when you live in, in, your, in your present, then uh, you, you, you know about your past, you know about the present, which is soon going to become past. This, this is a very remarkable insight. That present is not static. What you see today, what I see today in front of me is only to belong to the conditions today. Tomorrow this will change. And in fact, in the process of our watching, the present is going, it's moving, it's remarkable. And you know, it's a very difficult idea. Uh, the, the, this idea uh, philosophers have dealt with, you know, when they, they discuss time, that time is always even changing. But then saying it in such wonderful ways, today is going, yes, past is gone, today is going, the present is going. And then he says, tomorrow is day after tomorrow is yesterday. That's how he can, which means that time goes on irrespective of what we want. We can take part in it, we can observe time, we, we, we might even, uh, in fact, uh, be uh, insensitive to the presence of time. Time does not bother. And uh, he has, in fact, gone into the entire philosophy of, of India, uh, you know, the, since time immemorial. Then, you know, time has been discussed like this. So, time, in fact, is in, in the Indian conditions, in Sanskrit, the Sanskrit word for time is Kal. 
and kal has so many connotations. One call, uh, definition, well, one connotation is that kal is death, somebody's time has come. So that way you realize that such a difficult idea which is philosophically uh, you know, uh, very complex to comprehend, this idea is uh, presented so beautifully and in such simple lucid terms by, by, by R.K. Narayan in this particular quote. Okay, uh, the man was born in 1906. He started writing in 1930s. We have discussed 1930s earlier uh, with respect to other novelists, but let me uh, just say in passing that uh, 1930s was a uh, very, uh, you know, uh, difficult period full of challenges. When India was not the same as it was before, nor would it give any clue to the future. And it, uh, you know, uh, made people afraid of itself. Things were changing so fast. Honesty and dishonesty were, uh, were standing at that point of time, uh, you know, in, in front of each other, questioning each other. Uh, the uh, politics was changing uh, in a crucial sense. It was not the politics of the 20s. In 20s, uh, people were full of excitement. When, when the 30s came, there were bigger questions in front of them and they didn't know how to, how to uh, resolve them. And uh, because they could not resolve them, therefore, uh, the 1940s to a person of 1930 would look really, uh, you know, fearful, would look uh, that way, very, very, very difficult to comprehend. So if that is the case, then Rakhine starts writing then. His novel, first novel, Swami and Friends, uh, appears in 1935, Bachelor of Arts in 1936, The Dark Room in 1938. So, in a way, the entire 1930s is captured by R. K. Narayan in these three novels and uh, not that he is talking about uh, the time, but then the way he presents characters, the characters uh, have situations which have in fact carry the rhythms of the, the, the 1930s uh, reality. And those, those rhythms, uh, maybe R. K. Narayan himself is not very sure as to what he is saying because he is uh, lost completely in the, in the description. But uh, such a thing could have been written only in the 1930s. The writer is that creatively alert about the time uh, in which he is composing his uh, early novels. And uh, they are simple novels, they talk about simple people. Uh, he does not you know, uh, get characters from the, the larger cities, he gets them confined to the, the smaller place. And uh, once again, uh, he is not talking about the background of the, of the, of the children, of the, of the other people. Uh, he is he's talking about what they say and what they do and their planning and he is uh, focusing upon their mind than on their, you know, uh, other actions that will affect uh, their, their surroundings. So all this is there, but then you read the novels today, uh, it's, a, it's a good time to read the novels, already uh, uh, 70, 80 years have passed from 1930s onwards and if you read today, then you know that you have in fact been transported back to the 1930s, which was a different kind of India. And uh, since the gap is uh, big between 1935 and us, and then this novel is there. So read uh, Swami and Friend and you realize that a lot of water has flown down the Ganges in the meantime. Then you know he is quiet for some time. Why is he quiet? People have guessed that he is quiet because as he uh, publishes his uh, dark room, the dark room in 1938, the clouds of war has, have started hovering over the whole world, the Second World War. The Second World War is going to begin in 1939 and everybody is uh, full of apprehensions as to what is going to happen to the world. We are indirectly involved in the Second World War because our uh, you know, uh, ruling uh, country, Britain uh, in, the, in the 1930s is a part of the Second World War and the, the uh, uh, life of the colony is going to be uh, crucially affected by what goes on on the front in the uh, Second World War. So uh, maybe that is the reason why he could not write much at that time, must have been thinking, uh, must have been reading the accounts and hearing accounts on the radio, must have been discussing things with his friends and must be at the same time disturbed also as to how the world is going to unfold itself. And a writer requires a kind of uh, uh, rest from, from uh, the goings on in society. And uh, want, uh, the writer wants to, uh, you know, uh, assimilate all that is happening around him. So maybe he is uh, at that point of time uh, in the process of assimilating the unfolding reality of India uh, in the 1940s. But then 
his uh, the English teacher is published in 1945 around the same time as the war is going to end the financial expert this comes seven years after and there's a very serious uh, kind of a critique of the trade the, the system of uh, you know uh, money changing hands and uh, how you know uh, uh, people then respond to this challenge of the money which is so very fickle and and, and can be made you know uh, on, on the sly at the cost of people who are innocent and they can be uh, interpreted by the people who deal in money as stupid so financial expert there is a financial expert there and uh, the, the the whole thing is really very funny my dateless diary there he is talking about his own life and and, and the happenings there he is writing of himself as a as, as a writer the dateless diary is published in 1960 then he also uh, <coughs> wrote two uh, volumes of short stories and uh, those volumes were called an astrologer's day and lolly road and there once again the same reference to places that is very fond of um, occurs in, in the short stories the short stories are episodes but in these episodes the, the central part is always the person the person who is responding to the reality of his or her time basically his time because he's uh, picking up character you know who come from uh, the, the the male community mainly of course there are women all, all around there are mothers there are daughters there are children Uh, there are aunts uh, in the family that, that there is a larger kind of a dimension given to uh, both the genders all that is there but then uh, um, if you look at it uh, a bit you know uh, <coughs> consciously you realize that he is uh, uh, basically going into the psychology of the males and it is these males you know who are devious who are cunning who are all the time indulging in uh, tricks and all and therefore the carriers of all the vacillations of Uh, human uh, weaknesses and behavior they can be easily captured by because the carriers of them are males anyway i'll not go into this question uh, so far as uh, the present discussion is concerned but then uh, just just in passing one can say that he is talking about the episodes and the episodes relate to uh, you know characters in his in, in his fiction so uh, we 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 have to uh, you know uh, think of these things uh, i have already given you a kind of idea about the writer about his interest about the background he starts writing in 1930s and from there on we can go into the finer aspects of uh, his writing concerning themes concerning his attitudes concerning his value system and concern, concerning the kind of uh, you know prose he will write the kind of language he will use and you know the aesthetic principle that he will observe why is writing why, 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 why is he you know uh, raising questions in a manner that people may or may not take him as seriously as a philosopher would expect him to do so so all these questions uh, we can uh, briefly you know uh, deal with uh, in the uh, later part of the discussion as we carry on thank you Yes, friends. Uh, we uh, would be um, thinking about the concerns of Arkin Ryan in his writing, uh, which have not been 
touched at, at some length uh, so far, but we can take up at least one statement uh, from him to find out as to what he is talking about and uh, what he has plans to do but cannot do so under pressures from circumstances. So all this is there in one quote that, that I have selected for, for, for you to consider. And this quote is from him. He says that in fiction, things had to become political earlier. The mood of comedy, he says, the sensitivity to atmosphere, the probing of psychological factors, the crisis in the individual soul and its resolution were forced into the background in the earlier period. He is talking about the 1930s and 40s when he started writing. That was the period when the national movement was on and everybody was involved in the fight directly or indirectly. They were discussing uh, the national movement. They were discussing the injustices uh, that were being done to our economy and society by the <coughs> ruling uh, regime <coughs> which, which, which had its roots in uh, Europe, uh, in England. And at that point of time, he says it's understandable that writers uh, were political. It was, uh, in any way, the pressure or circumstance that compelled writers to become political in their approach. So they would be talking about injustice, they, they would be talking about uh, violence, they would be talking about the high-handedness of the British regime, and they will express their anger in such a manner that that anger started motivating writers to uh, take it up as a challenge uh, in the creative sense of the word. But uh, he said this, and uh, he is a very conscious writer in that sense. He knows that uh, uh, during the national movement, you could not take up some important issues, but those important issues were there. And they were, he says, they were forced into the background. Which were the issues? Let me uh, pick up again from the quotation. The issues that could not be taken up in the pre-independence period were these. The mood of comedy. You can't be comic at a time when the country is involved in a fight. Okay, that's a good thing that you want to entertain people and you want to uh, regale the audience. You make them relax and they should enjoy reading. So that comedy is important. Okay, that's one aspect. The second aspect is sensitivity to atmosphere, not merely to the individual behavior, not merely to the incident that is there in front of us, but about the environment around, about the situation that is there in the atmosphere. But come 1950s and the writers start talking about the atmosphere, atmosphere of the economic, social and cultural kind, atmosphere also of, for instance, geography of rivers, atmosphere of air, atmosphere of all, all, all the, you know, uh, what could be called ecological things. Writers could not at that point of time in the pre-independence period think about the uh, aspect of atmosphere. The third is the probing of psychological factors. That is important. In fact, the writers did not have time in the earlier period to go into why people are motivated to take up certain questions in preference to others. Why, 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 for instance, they are at that point of time talking about issues of education, issues of uh, double dealing by the political leaders. Why are they not going into the uh, psychological aspects of people? Why people do so? How do they feel? How, how does a coward, you know, uh, sometimes score as well as a brave person? And you go into the psychology of it. You also, uh, are, as a writer, uh, try to explain and elaborate the conditions in the mind, what one thinks and how that thinking is, is sought to be projected through one's writing or through one's behavior. So all this was not discussed other than in, in literature. But in the 1950s onwards, the preferences of writing changed. And now they could talk about the working of the mind in the novels and literary uh, different pieces. <coughs> the crisis in the individual soul it's a high word. It's a heavy word also. What is, Indian, what, what is individual soul? And can there be a crisis there? One can think of a crisis in society. One can be a think uh, of crisis in the family. One may think of a crisis uh, at the, in, in school uh, or, or in the political thing. But can there be a crisis in the soul? I was, uh, uh, you know, uh, slightly uh, surprised to, to read this phrase from him. But then writers know that the soul is being involved in certain things and that the soul is not able to, re to react to a particular circumstance. What does one do then? 
when the soul is facing a crisis, then I think, and that's what he's suggesting, that the writers take over. Then they, you know, go into the life condition in such a manner that people's mind starts reacting in a somewhat confused manner. And the very value system, uh, you know, comes to a kind of stop. One doesn't know whether what one is thinking is right or wrong. That is when the soul and the mind, they become disturbed and they can't react and respond properly. So this is what he is saying. Perhaps, I, I, I can only guess, because as a writer, then he would not merely talk about it. He will show the crisis of the soul in the behavior of the person at the level of the mind. And that's what he says he wants to do. And now that 1950s have arrived and the country is free and uh, political struggle is not uh, to be as strong as it was earlier uh, against an enemy. And now we have to think inwards in order to understand our, uh, our needs and requirements better. Therefore, the issues with time in literature also change. And then he says, the soul and its resolution. So first you have the crisis, but then you can also think of the resolution. How, how, how does, does one resolve? If, if one's soul is at, at, at any point of time uh, feeling guilty, if the, the soul is disturbed, if the soul is perplexed, how does one resolve the crisis? So that is where writers come in the picture and they tell us the way out. This, he says, uh, can be done by literature, but not earlier. I think it's a very good insight, and we should think about it, that writers at one time write about politics, write about ideology, write about dissensions, conflicts, and there's another time when they start probing minds of people, probing their mental states, pro probing their problems at, at, at the level of psychology. And when they find that per uh, perplexity also can be a big challenge and an issue, at the level of what he calls the mind or the soul. So a uh, very profound kind of uh, insight. And uh, one doesn't expect this uh, you know, uh, <coughs> from R. K. Narayan to bring in all these aspects. But you know, uh, he appears simple. He's not a simple writer. And, uh, behind simplicity is hidden so much of uh, uh, you know, uh, crisis, so much of questions, so much of sadness. Maybe his characters are very happy and enjoying on the surface. But the kind of sadness that they have, in their heart. That also is uh, given a peep into by the writer when he writes. Then there's, there, there's a uh, quotation. This, this is what the writer uh, felt himself about the society in which he lived. And he would write like this. This, this is what uh, his matter of choice uh, came up as. And then, you know, from there, let's have a view of the critic about uh, R. K. Narayan. This says Ayanga uh, in his famous, you know, uh, book of history of uh, English writing in English. And he says, uh, Indian writing in English, and he says, Arkea, and then this uh, 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 Ayangar, he says, Malgudi is Narayan's castle bridge. But the inhabitants of Malgudi, although they may have their recognizable trappings, are essentially human, and hence have their kinship with all humanity. Why is he saying that uh, Malgudi is a kind of castle bridge? Because there is a writer in English. Uh, he was quite popular uh, in, the, in the 20th century India, uh, Thomas Hardy. And uh, he always talked about, uh, you know, places which were uh, close to uh, Westerbridge, where Wessex, and uh, his novels are called Wessex novels also. So maybe R. K. Narayan learned his trade of identifying a uh, place and then, uh, you know, uh, start belonging to it and talking about it. So he says that as Casterbridge is important, that famous novel, uh, you know, uh, important in the case of uh, um, Thomas Hardy. In the same manner, Malgudi is an important uh, kind of a place for, in the scheme of things, of R. K. Narayan. So that that comparison is very valid, because uh, Hardy had a great uh, internality and closeness for the place uh, where, where he lived and from where he picked up characters. And the same is true from this. So uh, Casterbridge is a very important novel. The mayor of Casterbridge, that is the name of the novel. And Malgudi is a very important place and has given rise to short stories and novels written by this person. And uh, what he says is that even though uh, <coughs> the trappings are there, the outer you know, uh, features of life are there, but inside the outer features you have the human. And the human in all of us uh, combines us with one another, bonds us with one another, and it is there you know, that we start making sense of the writing that we read. 
and we read uh, Malgudi uh, stories, we read Malgudi descriptions uh, in his novels, and then there we find that all his characters <coughs> at one level or the other, even though they differ in their trappings or traits, at the level of uh, their, their, their feelings, at the level of their, their deeper experiences, they are all human. And this human quality uh, uh, is to be emphasized in order to understand the crux of what this man is saying. Uh, some people have talked about, in the case of Arkham uh, spirituality and mysticism, which he refers to uh, in, in, in some novels. But then, uh, let's, let's not forget that Arkham uh, takes up those issues as challenges, takes up the, uh, those issues as points of interest. But when he depicts them, then he brings in his own rationality. So maybe he's talking about certain issues where, you know, you talk of, of the soul, you talk of this self, you talk of that self. All of us have watched their famous film called Guide in which they were acted, that was based on uh, Arjun uh, you know, novel. And of course, even though there are differences uh, between the depiction uh, in the uh, pages of the novel and the presentation of things uh, on the screen, it was quite close to the novel. Uh, and uh, one can say, you know, that the way uh, the main hero, uh, towards the end of the, of the, of the film, uh, starts talking to himself. Uh, in those days, the camera tricks of today were not there. And yet, you know, uh, the, the person who was uh, producing and directing the play, he was able to visualize too, they were on the stage, talking to one another. So this kind of split in the personality of the main character uh, that had its uh, mystical dimensions and Ark and Ryan have all was uh, definitely dealing with this issue in the page of the novel. But then, was he spreading any kind of message which would be mystical a message? No. The film showed this, but we read the novel and we realize that Ark and Ryan is very clearly and alertly focused on what the person is facing in his mind. And that uh, what the character says in the novel, that is not the opinion of the writer. The writer is only presenting that uh, dialogue which suits the situation of the character. But that doesn't mean that the writer uh, has the same opinion about the character or about the situation that is depicting there. So you have the, uh, you know, the, the, this thing there in, in Ark and Ryan that uh, he always uh, is rational. He always is thinking of his mind. He is always alert as a, as, as, a, as a writer. He has a very keen eye. He knows what is, what, what is wrong and where. He also knows where questions exist and that he cannot be confident. And if he is not confident, his tone becomes modest. That is, that is what, you know, is his greatness about this writer, that he does not largely share his opinion with the characters who also have an opinion. They hold an opinion, but they are, uh, that is not the opinion of the writer. So, look at this and then you realize that Arkham Narayan is not, uh, even though he is taking up mystical issues, he is not a uh, votary of them in the sense in which we understand the term. Then, uh, you know, uh, we have already talked about the financial expert and the guide to a certain extent. These novels belong to the 1950s and things are changing in these novels. Arkham Narayan is talking about the economic reality, the reality of trade, the, 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 the reality of people taking to playing games, being crooks. All he is showing, which he was not showing earlier in, in the novels of the 1930s and 40s. Then he was talking about childhood's innocence. But in this case, he is talking about the supposed uh, maturity of people who want to deceive and cheat others. Uh, the, the writer is keeping an eye on this. The writer is not exactly uh, appreciative or approbative of, of these things, and yet he knows that these are the traits of life in today's world, and therefore his job is to uh, uh, present it. His job is to make people familiar with this kind of ways uh, that are being pursued by the characters or real people in uh, life. And uh, when he does that, then of course the, the world changes for him. It's not the world of the 1930s and 40s, it's the world of 50s and 60s. It's a new India that is coming. So you can see today's India, the India of the 2017, from the presentations of his novels that were written in the 1950s. At that point of time, those features of behavior were in the seed form. Those tricks that people played at that time, they were in the seed form. Today you can see that in the, in, in, in the proper way in which uh, things are being guided by the motivations of people who, have, who think of nothing except money all the time. And uh, in that process, they might in fact uh, bring a kind of a situation of crisis today. They don't bother about it. But then you look at those novels in the 
uh, 1950s uh, written in the 1950s and you know that Arkan Narayan was able to uh, uh, you know, see things and uh, also the direction in which uh, they would be moving later. So, this is uh, the vision of the writer, the, this is the way the writer you know uh, comprehends the reality of his time and then he goes into the various ways into which the, 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 this reality uh, can you know uh, move and finally, it might reach a place where it, it will be uncontrollable, it will not be easy to deal with. So, all those suggestions at the level of language, at the level of imagining, they are there in Arkanarayan in the writing of the 1950s and 60s. So, this is that phase, you know, you can call it the phase of difficulty, you can call it the phase of crisis, you can call it the phase of self-awareness. The words are you, you, for, for you to choose, for me to choose. But then, definitely, Arkan Narayan of the 1950s, 60s and 70s is not the same Narayan who was writing in the 1935 and later when you know he was celebrating a kind of innocence and vitality of childhood as he saw it. <coughs> so, Iyengar says that uh, <coughs> he uh, takes up three characters from three different novels, Sampath, Margaya and Raju, Raju from Guide and uh, Margaya from Financial Expert. And, and Sampat from Mr. Sampat and these three characters, how easily they respond to the blandishments of their uh, of the R. They are they are not intelligent enough to understand, you know, that they, they have to remain true and honest. So whenever some temptation occurs in their life, they rush to it and they accept it, they, they, they take it and they adopt it and, they, and and they start they become part of the temptation that is there around them. And R. Kenarayan from a distance is watching these characters. There is a character who can understand, who can enjoy, who can at the same time critically, uh, you know, uh, look at things. But the moment the temptation comes, the character falls. If the character falls, then the writer is watching, and watching with care that that, that okay. Now that he has fallen uh, uh, fallen to temptation, let's see how he behaves later. So this is the kind of cre uh, creative curiosity that this person is able to arouse in the course of his writing about these characters. So, uh, <clears throat> see the words used by the critic. These characters stifle the inner mumble. Inner mumble is always there. When I am doing something wrong, then somewhere in my heart I know that I am doing something wrong. So, there is that kind of a mumble. I have mumbled to myself. Am I right? Am I wrong? Should I do it? Can I stop it? This is the inner mumble. But then they stifle it. They curb it. They, 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 they press themselves hard to stop this so that they become once again focused on the wrong thing that they have adopted. I uh, choose a wrong thing, for some time I feel uneasy, I feel disturbed, I tell myself I am wrong, but later on I say no, no, do not think of this, always pursue it rightly. Everybody else is doing it, why not you? If everybody is succeeding, why should, why should you, you not succeed? So, I start telling this myself and the writer is watching me. I am not sure whether God is watching or not, but definitely the writer is watching the writer uh, next to me, the writer watching me or somebody like me, he is watching that person. And this is important. When people go to sleep mentally, morally, ethically, then the writer's job is to make them aware and if possible to waken them up. This is what the writer's job is and Arjuna Ryan would be doing this job at a very subtle level. All the time he would be giving us entertainment, he would be giving us humor, but in that entertainment and humor, there is a kind of a glance that makes us self-conscious. That is what great writing is and uh, Arkan Narayan is presenting this kind of a great writing to the India that is emerging in the post-independence period starting from 1947 up to 2001 when this person breathes his last. <coughs> in Narayan's novels, uh, this is the last quotation from Ayengar, there is generally a flight, people run away, an uprooting they leave one place and go to another, a disturbance of order. Naturally, if you are changing places, if you are changing your job, if you are, if you are changing your preoccupations, then there will be a kind of disturbance in the order. You are doing something one, uh, once earlier, now that you have left behind and you are face to face with a new set of conditions and in these conditions, you will have to uh, be very careful. So, all this, you know, uh, will uh, disturb the characters and then he says, followed by a return, a renewal, a restoration of normalcy. The writer is a very positive writer, he is not a destructive writer, 
he will not put you in, 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 in a state of gloom. He will not say nothing is possible. Arkendarayan is by no chance an existentialist. He will not simply say, okay, this is how the reality has come and you to bear with it. Bearing with it means adjusting to it and killing yourself in the process. That's what existentialist writing most of the time is. Arkendarayan, even though he's living in the state of uh, you know, existentialism, he's not an existentialist. He's a viewer of society, a viewer of, uh, of society and more than a viewer, <coughs> he's also a person who has a vision about society. This society inherently is human, so it will come out of it. When it comes out is a different matter, that's not for the writer to tell, tell us. But then, if the writer has the confidence that humanity is caught in the crisis, but it will come out of it, then there will be one kind of writing. In fact, if the writer is confident that the society will come out of its morass, come out of its inertia, and establish itself in a new kind of an order, then the writer is in a very good sense of the term, comic. In fact, this is what novel is supposed to be. And somebody way back in the uh, 19th century in England, uh, that's how the novel was defined. It was a comic epic poem in prose. Something, uh, I, uh, I think I discussed it in, in some other uh, you know, uh, area. But here I say that uh, if in one word one has to uh, describe Argan Ryan, one has to say, this person is a comic genius. And when you say he is a comic genius, then he is a comic genius because he can create a wonderful world in a situation which is very pressing, which is very disturbing. And he can, you read his novels and your faith in yourself will be renewed. That is what uh, is being done in the case of the writings of the 1960s and later. Let us uh, have a look at a different view uh, from uh, another critic. Uh, on, on R.K. Narayan, and uh, then we can, you know, briefly talk about features. You can rush through. Uh, there is a uh, <coughs> contemporary critic. She, of course, is also at the, at the moment not, not, not there. So she also died. Meenakshi Mukherjee, uh, a very good academic writer and uh, uh, one who uh, understood, you know, uh, fictional texts at, at a very close level. She has said this about R.K. Narayan, and she says, Malbury has been perceived as a quintessential Indian town. It is not one specific town, it is all the towns, quintessential Indian town. Ordinary and uneventful. People say it is an ordinary place and nothing happens, there is, there is no event that takes place there. Where shopkeepers ply their easy going trades, shopkeepers come to their shops in the morning, till the evening they sit and they are talking to this person, that person and their trade is easy going. Idlers sit around the market streets, gutter. There are a large number of people who are idlers, who have no work to do. They came in the morning and they will go back in the evening and they are wasting their time. Their critic can uh, note this and say this, but look at this idea. Idlers come in the morning and they go back in the evening and they have sat all through the day doing no work. It implies that this country also has a very serious problem of unemployment. People do not have work. So, people have been turned, turned to idlers. So, this, this is what is being suggested. And uh, this is what actually uh, the writer has himself noticed. That this is the, when you go to the market, you find that a large number of people come there not because they have some work. They came because they had no, nowhere else to go. So, they came to the market. They might have some chance of grabbing this thing or that thing. And uh, for that, they are waiting since morning. And they will go back only the, where they go back in the evening. Nobody knows, but one can imagine, you know, that they will be going to places where there will be no electricity, there will be places where there will be no hygiene, there will be places where there will be no food. But they have to go back and the next day once again they come. This is what Arkin Ryan depicts. He does not tell, tell us what to do, but he also does not tell us what to ignore. Because there he says, look at this fact, these people are idlers, they come to the shop, they do not have anything to buy, so they sit on the sides, but then finally they go back. Okay. Idlers sit around in the market street gutter. Benign crooks go about their business of cheating, gullible people. Benign crooks is a good phrase. Benign mean, uh, means, means uh, you know, kind people, but they are crooks. They have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, take money from somewhere and they will, uh, you know, uh, create stories. They, they will entice people to buy certain things which will be no, not useful at all, but then they can make some money themselves out of it, the, the benign crooks. So, he is talking about them. 
husbands absent mindedly torture their wives the wives are try to talking to uh, trying uh, trying to talk with them and they are absent minded they don't even bother as to what the, what the woman is saying and uh, arkendran is watching this scene and is presenting it in this or that novel all in a gentle and unchanging rhythm this is the world of arkendran's novels so malgudi and his uh, this is what uh, is, 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 is an important dimension malgudi so far as this person is concerned is a hindu upper caste pan india you can see that in the market only the upper caste you know rule and they are there all over india pan india they are not just there in malgudi so if you read malgudi if you read about malgudi then realize that malgudi is india and in, in the entire india which is in the opinion of this writer hindu upper caste so where are the lower caste this is the question that uh, the, uh, this uh, critic minakshi mukherjee has raised and very pertinently this question and the writer is not telling anything but is showing it and once you see it then you realize that well if this is happening then we should sit up and ask questions from us and others this is the kind of thing and i'll now, now sum up in uh, two minutes uh, i can just uh, read out a few points that i have made uh, you know uh, indirectly in the discussion for that first point is that he is rational and unsentimental he is not trying to sweep us off our feet he is merely telling us and he is rational he is using his mind he is not using any kind of belief two he maintains a critical distance between characters in the novels and himself so he is not impressed by what the characters say in his novels when they say then he is hearing very carefully and he is amused thirdly irony remains his irony remains his everlasting mold you you can never uh, you know uh, pinpoint arkinarayan that he is saying this because he might also be saying its opposite in the same sentence which means that he is ironical he is he, is he is critical of what he is saying he takes an amused interest in everything there is nothing like important nothing like unimportant both are equally important so is he concerned and he is amused by what he sees there is at the same time a strong streak of sociology that is active in him he is talking about society its various layers he, he picks up characters not just at random he picks up with, with under a plan so there are this class there is an upper class there is slightly middle class there is different layer of class and you become aware of the presence of society and the last point that I, that I make is that writing all across remains dramatic his writing is dramatic in the best sense of the word it's not a description you know that absorbs you it is a description that asks questions from you and you 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 start you know shaking up yourself as if you know you have to remain alert all the time so he makes you alert he 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 prods you he 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 peaks you he he, he does, does, does this this uh, kind of a thing regularly in novels and for this reason he always keeps us intellectually and emotionally awake so i would say that uh, as a great writer arthur narayan has used fiction to the effect of understanding as to what is right and wrong in society and how we have to keep thinking about it so that society does not go in the wrong direction thank you with this note thank you sir thank you so very much today we had a vivacious session on uh, rk narayan and dear friends we believe that uh, you might have benefited from today's session so do write to us at info.cc at the rate nic.in we would be waiting for your feedbacks and would be uh, waiting for you uh, for the next session that in the, uh, future session we would be talking on another important author till then take care goodbye thank you sir thank you so very much